Hello and welcome into another episode of Locked On Wolves. Today on the show, the best lineup combinations to this point in the season might come as a bit of a surprise. Maybe not. We're going to dig into it, see what the common themes between the two. There's two lineups that are clearly the best. What's the common thread between the two? We'll also look at uh, what's keeping the Wolves offense near the top 10 in the league and how can it stay there moving forward. It's all come and welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is sponsored by Prize Picks. Download the Prize Picks app today and use the code LOCKDOWNNBA. Get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize picks run your game. Happy Tuesday, everybody. The Timberwolves do not play until Thursday this week. That allows us to take a step back. A couple of exciting wins over the weekend and a uh, lot to talk about. A lot we covered on Monday's show, but this gives me, you know, today's show, tomorrow's show, and even part of Thursday's show, the Wolves play at the Raptors Thursday night to kind of take a half step back and, and, you know, take some stock of where we're at with the Wolves now 14 games into the season, you know, right around that 15% mark. And, uh, you know, like, let's let's talk some lineup data. The sample sizes are starting to grow just a little bit. We're over a month now into this thing. So uh, we're going to talk lineup data. We're going to talk um, it, it, what's working and, and what is improving, but could be better about the offense to this point this season. So we'll do all that on the show today. A big thank you off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. A reminder about the Lockdown Wolves newsletter. Um, a quick, they actually just sent out some data on this, on uh, how we're doing on the newsletter subscriptions. I'm just going to put this out there. There's a couple of small market teams that are ahead of us. This is a new thing we started just a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, like we're behind Memphis in terms of subscriptions for the newsletter. We're behind Charlotte. Like these are teams that the Wolves are better than and, you know, similar size markets. Like I think we, I think we could do better. So head over to LockdownDaily.com and uh, help me out with a subscription to the Lockdown Wolves newsletter. You'll get it every day in your inbox, usually late morning-ish. Um, and it'll give you kind of the, the, the key high points from the, from the show for the day. Uh, if you haven't listened to it already, plus there's some great national content that comes out a couple times a week, some really great writers that are included in the newsletter. So again, over at LockdownDaily.com and you'll uh, get your day started with the all new Locked on Wolves newsletter. And I truly, truly appreciate it. All right, let's dive in. So I wanted to talk lineups. I, I think that's something that it's, it's um, the sample size matters less in my opinion with lineups. I, it, it matters, right? We obviously have to factor that in uh, to some extent. But if you're just talking like an individual player's stat line or something like that, the sample size needs to grow because there's so many other factors. But lineup data to this point, I think can tell us a lot. It would take an extended trend to like really flip lineup data at this point, right? Like that's, that's enough of a sample. Um, and so I wanted to start by like, what are the Wolves' most used lineups and where do they rank in terms of their best lineups? Well, they have three lineups that they've used for more than 100 possessions. Only three. There's one other one they've used for 77 possessions, but that's a distant fourth. Their starting lineup, obviously, they've used the most and actually about th almost three times as much as their next most used lineup, which makes sense, right? They start every game, every third quarter, and they close the majority of games with their with their starting five. And uh, that lineup is their third most successful lineup, at least in terms of lineups that they use frequently. Their other two are both wildly successful. So I want to examine those and look at what the common threads are between the two and, and why this is the data we're getting on this. First of all, the most obvious common thread between the two, there's two things. One, they both include, I bet you could guess this, the bench trio. Nas Reed, Dante DiVincenzo, Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Both of their best two lineups include those three players. The other thing that's similar about them is they both include two starters, obviously, and neither one of them includes Jaden McDaniels. Okay, so their best lineup 
has been used in 101 possessions. It's a 95th percentile lineup, according to Cleaning the Glass. So what that means is that's how it compares to all lineups that have played at least 100 possessions together league-wide. So Cleaning the Glass takes every single lineup the Wolves have used, and they'll only put a percentile on it if they've used it over at least 100 for at least 100 possessions. So it just qualified following Sunday's game. That lineup's been used 101 possessions. It's a 95th percentile lineup, has a plus 28 and a half differential. It's 97th percentile on defense and 82nd on offense. So it's a little better defensively. So yeah, you could guess Rudy Gobert's in that lineup. It's The lineup is the three bench guys, Nas Reed, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, Dante DiVincenzo, plus Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert. So the two more veteran starters plus the three bench guys is the Wolves' best lineup that's actually been used more than 100 possessions this year. It's a plus 28.5. Their next best lineup is still awesome, a 92nd percentile lineup, and they've only used it 21 possessions more. They've used it 122 possessions to that same bench trio, and it's the other two non-Jade McDaniels starter, starters, Anthony Edwards and Julius Randle. So that lineup is Ant, DiVincenzo, Alexander Walker, Randle, and Nas. That lineup is otherworldly offensively, 95th percentile, scoring 133.6 points per 100 possessions. They're only 61st percentile defensively because there's no Rudy on the floor. We know Julius Randle's had some defensive issues this year. I don't think Nas has been particularly good defensively either. And Ant's had his moments where he hasn't been as well. So that lineup is, you know, passable, 61st percentile defensively, but they're so good offensively, they're still a 92nd percentile unit. So the two common threads are the bench trio and no Jaden McDaniels. Now, their third best lineup is their starting lineup. Let me rephrase that. Their third best lineup that they use with frequency, because actually their third best lineup that they've used for anything more than 20 possessions is that fourth one on the list that isn't quite to the 100 possession threshold. And that is the bench trio once again with Ant and Rudy instead of Mike and Rudy. And that's still a plus 16.9, but it's only 77 possessions. But then you have to go all the way down to like any lineup that's got 15, 17 possessions. There's a bunch in there, of course, of these different combinations to find one that's as good as the starters. The starters have still been good. They're a plus 5.4, a 58th percentile unit. They're 58th percentile on defense and they're 63rd on offense. So as we've noticed, like it doesn't take these numbers to tell us it's been overall pretty good, but they feel like they're still searching on both ends of the floor. And this team truly finds its identity when the bench trio is on the floor, DDV, Na, and Nas. So what does this tell us? Well, first of all, Jaden McDaniels had a difficult start to the season. He's had a couple good games. He's had a couple big threes. He's had some good defensive possessions, but he's been in foul trouble a little too much. He's, um, you know, had some frustration fouls. He's uh, had a couple games where he looked just kind of discombobulated offensively. It's just been a difficult start to the season. And we know that that switch can flip for Jaden, but he's had a difficult start to the season. So that to me, I'm not saying he's dragging the starting unit down completely because I think it also speaks to just how good those three guys have been off the bench. And in particular, Nikhil Alexander Walker. Nikhil has been awesome. Like you put him with anybody. If you want to mess with the lineup combinations and any lineup with Nikhil has been fantastic. The other thing that I think is pretty interesting here is that Dante DiVincenzo, like, if if you just watch Dante play, it doesn't feel like he's playing that well so far in the regular season. Like he had the five threes on Sunday and that was ho- hopefully him breaking out of a slump. But the eye test is like, all right, he looks a little bit, I'll use the word discombobulated again, a little bit out of sorts offensively. He looks okay defensively. He's playing hard, but you know, he's not a lockdown defender on bigger guards on the, at the point of attack. Um, and offensively, if he's not making threes, what's he really doing? You look at the individual metrics. Like if you want to look at like, any of the individual stuff like uh, wind shares over a basketball reference, he's actually the Wolves' worst rotation player based on wind shares. Uh, and it's not close. He's like significantly worse than Jaden even is. Okay. But any of the lineup data and DiVincenzo, any lineup with DiVincenzo is, is better than any lineup with Jaden, basically. Right. So there's obviously a lot of other factors and noise and small sample size and all that. But what does that tell you? It tells you. Like the best way to say this is DiVincenzo's doing, and this is very cliche, but it's a real thing. All of the little things, all of the other things he's, you know, like there's, there's head manning passes in transition, um, making the right play there. He's fouling less than Jaden. He's actually got a better rebound rate than Jaden. His defensive rebound rate is over 12%, which is like fifth on the team. 
as a as a guy that's exclusively playing in the backcourt and is what six four. Um, the fifty fifty ball stuff, the you know all of those other things that are not always super easy to quantify. Although I, I just did with the rebound rate and the assist rate. By the way, is eighteen percent. Jaden's is just eight percent. Like obviously Dante's initiating offense far more than Jaden McDaniel's is, but it's those little ancillary things that add up to help benefit the lineups that Dante's in. And it's not simply he's playing with better players. Jaden plays with the starters. Jaden plays more minutes than Ant with Ant than Dante does, right? So it speaks as much, I think, to, to Jaden's struggles as it does to DiVincenzo. But again, this is where you have to be careful with stuff, with some of the individual metrics and, and advanced stats early in the season, especially like a win shares or something like that. It's not as simple as that. You have to factor in the team context, the lineup data, et cetera. And it paints the picture that Dante's just had a, you know, by his standards, a disappointing start to the season. Obviously, the three-point percentage is only 32%, which would be, I think, a career low or close to a career low for him. That's going to improve, and we saw it improve in a big way. We was what, 5 of 10 on Sunday. But that's not the only factor here. He's doing some of the other stuff that helps lift the lineup. A couple more points on the lineup, and then I want to get into some offensive stuff related to the Wolves. We'll do all that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our title sponsors over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action. With over 10 million members and billions of dollars, billions with a B in award winnings, Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less on at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. Run your game all season long on Prize Picks. Again, up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. It is the also the only real money daily fantasy platform that has an injury insurance policy. So your lineup stay in play even if one of your players gets hurt. If your player leaves in the first half for either uh, basketball or football and doesn't return, Prize Picks will keep your lineup live. They also invented the flex play. That means you can still cash out even if your lineup isn't perfect. You can double your money even if one of your picks doesn't hit and they put all their members first. So all the withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When your picks hit, you just get your money in as quick as 15 minutes. Sign up today, get $50 instantly when you play $5. Again, you don't even need to win to get the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. You can download the app today. Use the code LOCKDOWNNBA to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Like, for instance, on Thursday, you could take Ant more than, you know, 27 and a half points and Nikhil Alexander-Walker more than two and a half threes in the game. And you'd be you know, maybe in good shape on Thursday against the Raptors. Again, download the app today. Use the code LOCKDOWNNBA to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Prize picks. Run your game. <coughs> All right. A couple more lineup notes here for the Wolves. Um. Rudy is still having his typical impact defensively, even if the Wolves overall have been, um, I, I don't know, like we're obviously spoiled after last season, but I think I, I kind of took it for granted that this year's Wolves team would be a top three defensive team and they may still be, but right now, like on cleaning the glass, oh man, I filtered it by last year, not this year. Let me fix this. Um, On cleaning the glass right now, the Wolves are the 10th best defense in the league in terms of points per 100 possessions. They are kind of middle of the pack, upper middle of the pack, like in the 10 to 15 range and basically everything in terms of how they're playing defensively. That's worse than I expected. And But also, by the way, at times they've played so bad defensively this year and the transition defense has been so bad that, I don't know, it sounds really cliche to say there's nowhere to go but up. Isn't that the case? I mean, isn't this pretty much the floor for the Wolves' defense? Like, are they ever going to play worse than they have at times in the first 14 games of the season? I, I don't know. I'd, I'd be shocked. Obviously, it'd be a really bad sign for the season as a whole for the Wolves. But the point is, uh, I think we kind of took for granted that this team would ultimately be, at least I did, a top three defensive team. I certainly didn't want to take for granted them being the best team in the league. Again, it's really hard to repeat as the team's best defense, especially without the exact same lineup. I think the biggest thing we can take away, again, obviously, first 14 games, 
But the defense with Rudy Gobert off the floor has been far worse than it needs to be. With Rudy on the floor, just the straight Rudy on court numbers, they're an 81st percentile defense. And, you know, we can look at what that compares, you know, compared to last year. Okay, let's see. 81st percentile defense with Rudy on the floor this season. Rudy on the floor last season was a 95th percentile defense. So Rudy lineups are still not as good as they were last season. However, the gap is even greater when it comes to the non-Rudy lineups. Non-Rudy lineups last year were 86th percentile defensively. Think about that. I bet that's way better than anybody would have expected. It's better than what I expected. But obviously, with the team as good as defensively as they were, it had to be pretty good without Rudy on the floor. So they were 86th percentile defense last year with Rudy off the court. Guess what they are this year? Eighth percentile. That's what's dragging the defense down. Has Rudy played to his standards? Well, you know, a week and a half ago, I was blaming him for he had a couple of miserable games mixed in there. Uh, during that three-game losing streak, he was bad in Portland. He was bad in, uh, forget what the game was, the Sunday before they went to Portland. Uh, that home loss that they had, oh, the Miami game. It was bad. He got outplayed by uh, by the rookie in, in Portland. Um, but, like, he's had some really good games. Like, he basically single-handedly won that first Raptors game for the Wolves that ended up being a blowout. But he was the best player on the floor in that game. He played great against Sacramento on Friday for most of that game. Um, so, again, the Rudy lineups are not as good as they were last year. But they're close-ish. The defensive lineups without Rudy Gobert were 86th percentile last year. This year, they're 8th percentile. They're giving up 122 points per 100 possessions with Rudy Gobert off the floor this year. That maybe shouldn't be a surprise if you've watched all 14 games this year, but that's a, a huge difference. And honestly, like a bit, I'm not going to have the full Cat Randall conversation now because this isn't that. That's not what I was I was planning to do here. We can at some point, but a huge reason for this is Carl Anthony Towns was pretty good defensively last year. And I know he's struggling for the Knicks defensively, and I don't put that all on Cat. I put that on the Knicks for thinking he's going to defend. Uh, like he's Mitchell Robinson defensively or Rudy Gobert or, you know, for doing what Tibbs is asking him to do and be the back line of defense for that team. That's not the cat role. The Timberwolves tried that. Tibbs tried that in Minnesota. It's not what that, it was never going to work out that way. Cat's role next to Rudy. And defensively, he wasn't the anchor necessarily of those, you know, he was never the rim protector, even when Rudy was off the floor. The Timberwolves were still throwing guys like Nas and Jaden out there to block shots from the weak side, but Cat was still providing a big physical body that was moving his feet, head on a swivel, communicating. We haven't seen that from Julius Randle. He's had his moments, and, and and we talked about this when the Wolves first acquired Randle. I think there's going to be moments that are better than what Cat was defensively. I think certain matchups, he'll be better than Cat. He won't foul as much. He'll be equally as physical, if not more physical. He's he's just built better than Cat. But the low points are going to be much lower, which is saying a lot in terms of what Cat did defensively last year. Um, you know, I'm not talking about like overall low moments, like the bowling people over in key moments and offensive fouls and complaining and all that stuff. Um, but the, it's going to be peaks and valleys with Julius Randle defensively. Last year with Cat, we saw consistency. It was a baseline of production defensively. The Wolves knew what they were going to get from Carl Anthony Towns, and Julius Randle's been up and down and up and down and more down than up through 14 games. So the non-Rudy defense needs some help. And Nas Reed needs to step up. And Jaden needs to step up. Because where are they going to get rim protection from? It's got to be Jaden. It's not Julius. It's not Nas. It's got to be Jaden McDaniels. It's got to be, you know, to an extent it can be Nas. But he's not a traditional rim protector. These guys are more weak side shot blockers than anything else. And clearly they're not going to strike fear in anybody like Rudy Gobert. But to try and replicate what they did last year when Rudy was off the floor, they have to find an answer. And, and you know, if this continues this way, maybe I need to dig in a bit more and actually watch more film on what this looks like with Rudy off the floor. Like, scheme-wise, are they doing anything drastically different than what they did last year? Or is Randall just that much worse than Cat? And also, the other thing that I should mention, I think I said this a little bit ago, setting this part up, but not having Kyle Anderson is massive. That is the, the other biggest difference. Having Cat plus Kyle Anderson is much better than Julius Randle. And, you know, Dante DiVincenzo is a good defender, but the size, the length, the ability to guard bigger players, that isn't there from Julius, which, or excuse me, from Dante, which means everybody else is bumped down a rung in terms of guarding a bigger player. Because that's basically what you're doing, is you're swapping the Kyle Anderson role for Dante DiVincenzo. I thought it was going to be 
before this trade, it was going to be Joe Ingles stepping into the Kyle Anderson role. And while Dante DiVincenzo, at the end of the season, we may look back on this and say he's actually a better player than Kyle Anderson. That's entirely possible in a vacuum. And he may still be the better fit overall for this team, certainly offensively. But in terms of the defensive makeup of this team, especially without Rudy Gobert on the floor, that's a real question mark that we have to look at. So there's going to be more to come on that. I'm going to dig into it a bit more. We're going to talk about the real effect of losing slow-mo and losing cat on that second unit defense. Um, but I, I wanted to bring that up as again, the Wolves defense has been good overall because of the Rudy effect, because they've got perimeter defenders, because it's been good with Rudy on the floor, but they're, you know, they're three quarters, three, two thirds, eh, three quarters of what they were last year with Rudy on the floor, but they're what 10% if that, of what they were last year with Rudy off the floor. And that's a massive difference. I don't know how else to say that. Okay. I want to dig a bit on the Wolves offense. And I may spend more time on this um, on tomorrow's show as well, uh, kind of building out a few of these points. But I want to set that up here with a couple of things the Wolves are doing well or, or and or could be doing better still um, at this point this season. We'll do that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends over at FanDuel. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. Right now, Monday Night Football, or I should say last night, Monday Night Football, um, I talked about that on yesterday's show, and I think the line was a touchdown. It went up to 7.5 before the game on Monday night. If you want to talk NBA action, uh, on Tuesday night, the Wolves, of course, don't play till Thursday. It's always easy to talk about what the Wolves are up to, but uh, we don't have any lines. Let's see. Oh, we do have some Tuesday lines here. Uh, let's see. What's the most interesting one? Uh, Nuggets at Grizzlies. The Grizzlies are favored by three points at home on Tuesday night against the Nuggets. That's a pretty interesting one. Um, I feel like that's almost a stay away. The Mavs at home, minus 10 and a half over the Pelicans. Um, I actually don't think that's a terrible bet. That's a lot of points. Uh, for anybody, but I, I don't know, like the Pelicans have been so bad. They just got blown out again the other night. So I take a look at that one. When you get the hunch in the middle of a game, NBA, NFL, any other sport, you can check out the latest stats, view live play by play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit Fandle.com to join today. You get started with $150 in bonus bets. If you win your first $5 bet, that's Fandle.com. Never waste a hunch. Make every moment more with Fandle, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, let's close by talking about the Wolves' offense. So I want to like level set here by mentioning that the Wolves' offense has been pretty good so far this year. Now, if you look on basketball reference, they're in the top 10. If you look on cleaning the glass, which filters out garbage time and a possession heaves, uh, which, by the way, that probably, I guess I don't know how they define a heave. It says end of quarters that are likely to end up in a heave. I mean, like Julius Randle hit two buzzer beaters on Sunday. And like, obviously the game winner shouldn't have been counted a heave. The end of the first half wasn't really a heave. I guess it kind of was. It was pretty deep. But anyway, they're on cleaning the glass. The Wolves are 13th in offensive rating. 100 uh, points per 100 possessions. They're at 115.4. Tenth of a point behind Brooklyn. About a half point ahead of Atlanta. Okay. That's pretty good considering last year that I think they finished at 15th on cleaning the glass. Uh, they were as low as like, you know, low 20s or sorry. Well, high 20. I don't know. Low 20s. 20 to 23 range for a long time last season, languished in the teens and ended up closer to 15. Remember, they shot threes really well, especially during that time when Carl Anthony Towns was out, weirdly enough. Um, so what are the Wolves doing well and what's unique about their offensive profile? Well, we've talked pretty extensively about their three-point shooting, which was horrendous in Portland last week, was great in both Sacramento and at home on Sunday in the win over Phoenix. They're currently fifth in the league in percentage and they're third in attempt rate. Uh, they're, they're fifth in attempts per game. But again, because of their pace, their percentage of their field goal attempts that come from outside the arc are third in the league. And they're fifth in percentage. If they can stay in the top five in both of those categories, they're going to be set up for success this year offensively. There's no question about that. Okay. Well, what's keeping them from being in the top 10? Well, the biggest thing and the biggest difference from this year to last year is, is free throw rate. And on its face... It, it, and I said this, I said something similar last week where I was basically like, it's possible to raise your free throw rate and, you know, keep your three point rate higher. Just got to figure out a way to do it. 
Well, I, like, here's another way to say that. There are three teams that are currently in the top 10 in both effective field goal percentage as a team, which is, of course, buoyed by shooting threes well because it factors in the three-pointers are worth more. So your frequency and your accuracy from outside the arc will lift that. The Wolves are fifth in team effective field goal percentage. There are three teams that are top 10 in both that and free throw rate, okay? And the Wolves are fifth in effective field goal percentage, but they're just 15th in free throw rate. Now, the teams that are in the top 10 in both are really, really good. The Boston Celtics are second in one and eighth in the other. Sacramento is sixth in one and, and seventh in the other. The Lakers are ninth in effective field goal percentage, and sure enough, number one again in free throw rate. And let's see, that those are the only ones. Those are the three. Uh, Memphis is just outside. They're 11th and one and 10th in the other. So, what I say? Boston, Sacramento, and the Lakers all having really good offensive starts to the season. And they're in the top 10 in both categories. And to prove that this is possible to do over the course of a season with a, an offense that isn't otherworldly, well, the Wolves did it last year. They were 10th in effective field goal percentage and 8th in free throw rate. Now, it's going to be harder to do it without Carl Anthony Towns, but Julius Randle has a higher career free throw rate and in recent years than Carl Anthony Towns, and it's not particularly close. Despite losing Cat, the Wolves gained DiVincenzo. Uh, they subbed you know, Kyle Anderson out, and, and I guess those minutes go to DiVincenzo. And Julius Randle's been shooting the three well and isn't like, obviously, as a downgrade from three from Carl Anthony Towns. But, I mean, given how well he shot it, and maybe Anthony Edwards is, I don't know, I don't, I don't think he's Steph Curry at this point. Like, I think we've allowed that uh, that ship to sail. He's still 42% plus from three. Like, this team should still be top 10 in both categories. And it's not like the shot profile is bad. And, and again, we'll get more into this tomorrow. Um, but the Wolves are still, they shoot the fourth least long mid-range jumpers in the league. They're 23rd in total mid-range attempts in terms of frequency. So there's there's only seven teams that shoot less mid-range shots than the Wolves. Less than a quarter of their shots come from the mid-range, which is, is any two-point shot that's not considered at the rim. So what gives in terms of the Wolves' Uh, you know, overall effective field goal percentage, but their lack of free throw attempts. Well, the obvious answer is they're not getting to the rim. And while the three point rate is up and that's great, they're shooting slightly more from the mid range and they're turning the ball over like crazy. And that means there's just less shot attempts to go around. Last year, the Wolves are 11th in the league in rim attempts in terms of or percentage rim attempts. So 34% of their shots came at the rim last year. That was tied, actually tied for 10th in the league last year. Okay. So where are they this year, you ask? Tied for 10th last year in percentage of shots at the rim. Well, they're 24th, 30.6%. So about 3% less, which doesn't seem like a lot, but that's what? Between two and three shots a game, depending on how possession, how many possessions you're getting, or between three and four maybe. So we're in the two to four range per game. Less attempts at the rim. And less attempts at the rim means what? Less high percentage shots and less opportunities to uh, to, to get to the free throw line and improve that free throw rate. So while the Wolves are shooting a, an outstanding number of threes, and they're making a great number of threes, and they're not shooting that many more mid-range jumpers, they're shooting slightly more mid-range jumpers, and they're turning the ball over like crazy. Currently, the Wolves are, let's see, last year they finished the season 23rd in turnover rate, 14.5%. 23rd in turnover rate, 14.5%. This season, the Wolves are 23rd in the league. It's only 16.1%. But again, it's still too high. It's still far too high. And if we're talking about league percentiles, that's what I'm really comparing here. I'm not comparing the overall percentage because um, it, it's just it's easier. Like the game's not the same overall year to year. They're still in the bottom eight in the league in turnover percentage. I mean, that's that's the point here. Um, and that's that's contributing to less shot attempts, which contributes to less shots at the rim, which contributes to a lower free throw rate. So it really is a domino effect. And what's keeping them in such a great spot is they've shot the three ball so well, save for this three-game losing streak last week and a couple of other moments, and, and that's going to be the old live by the three, die by the three thing is overplayed. But to an extent, it's true. If you're going to shoot this many threes, if you have a bad shooting game, it's going to be a lot harder to win. Like as cliche as that is, that's just math. But if you make them, you're going to win. Like it, it's really that simple. Um, and, and the wolves more often than not make them. 
they've just got some other stuff they got to clean up. So the free throw rate's got to come up. We'll dig into this a bit more in the next couple of days. Again, this is a good reset week for us to kind of take the first 15% of the season and, and see where we're at. And I think the offense deserves a bit more digging. The defense, again, does as well, but it's going to be, the numbers aren't going to tell us a whole lot other than how important Kyle, I shouldn't say it that way. I already said what the numbers tell us, but it underscores no Kyle Anderson and Randall instead of Carl Anthony Towns makes a big difference for the non-Rudy lineups. But schematically, what's different? about the non-Rudy lineups uh, compared to what they did last year defensively. So both things I want to dig into here in the next couple of days. Um, and so we'll do that on Wednesday and Thursday. All right, that's all we got for you today here on the show. Big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you'd like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T-Wolves, and also at B-Beacon with two Bs, two Es, C-K-E-N. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. And a reminder about the Lockdown Wolves daily newsletter. Please sign up today. Help us defeat some of those other smaller market teams in terms of our readership. Um, and you can sign up for free right now at LockdownDaily.com. You'll get a daily newsletter with all your free Lockdown Wolves news. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast. And we'll catch you next time.